I mean, you speak so much. I mean, everything you've said, all the relevant points um, that, I mean, I, honestly, while I was listening to you, I was reflecting on my own mind space when I'm at yeah. work and, and the organization and how everything flows. But I think work culture is critical, right? It's yeah. it's at the center of, of, of everything and managing everything. What do you think? I mean, but what do you mean, actually, when you say the word culture? Because for me, when I think about culture, there's just so many different, you know, mindsets, ideas, norms. Um, and how does that all come together? And, and what does the word culture mean? Yeah. So, you know, culture in the most uh, sort of uh, common parlance has been described as the way we do things together here. But it is a combination of uh, your mindsets of the skill sets that the organizations bring brings forth or values um you know the way in which we do things here for example the way in which we hire people within the organization mm -hmm. uh, you know what we consider as high performance within this organization which behaviors do we uphold within this organization what are the kind of people who get identified as high potential people here right what does it take them to be able to really take on bigger responsibilities why should anyone make a career with us right and uh, you know how are we on rewarding how are we on recognition um you know uh, everyone's talking about human centricity at this point in time yeah which is like a really big buzzword but it means so many things and you cannot actually be human centric by force so you cannot be human centric because the organization saying we want people to be human centric it just means so many things at so many levels and it starts very significantly with the inner journey which is you know, you need to question, uh, you know, deeply held values, beliefs, assumptions, uh, especially people who are in leadership positions or tipping point positions where they can actually influence the culture because the culture is actually a reflection of uh, what we've what we've valued, what we've upheld, and also what we've allowed people to get away with. So if we allow people to be able to get away, uh, you know, with um, the downside of behaviors, it also means that we are allowing for uh, the organization, uh, you know, to normalize uh, behaviors, which in, in other, in, in most organizations that are seen as functional, these would not be easily accepted. Also, what does the organization say? You know, you have absolutely fabulous stuff on the websites of all the organizations, yeah? You know, their vision and their mission and what are their values and what leadership behaviors uh, do they expect from people? And I think the first lens that you actually need before putting up any of these words, because I understand that a lot of ad agencies or perhaps communication agencies advise them on what words to use and how to express themselves, uh, which is all great verbiage. But the idea is that it falls flat the minute you don't see your leader upholders. And so what are the mechanisms of people who are in leadership and if they're founder driven organizations and the founders need to be able to demonstrate um, those words? And in the way in which we uh, worked around this with organizations is it's always works the other way around. What are you already doing? What are you good at? What do you really uphold? What has enabled you to succeed as an organization? We'll, we'll pull threads from there to be able to say uh, that these, this is what we really value. And so, you know, just copying another organization's values or competencies and all that is not useful. Even picking it out of a dictionary is not useful at all. Um, you know, there is um, there's a big price to pay for model intelligence. You know, we cannot anymore, even if we did in the past, uh, say things and now not have mechanisms to uphold it. So, um, so back to your question on culture, right? So mindset, skill sets, which are authentic, which can be manifested. And can organizations change their culture? They can, by being able to talk about what they value now in the new economy. And that in the, in the post-pandemic era, this is what the organization is trying to achieve. And if we didn't behave in this manner, we would not be able to succeed. One of the organizations that we were working with on this high performance culture cascade asked us to do add on a segment around what we ended up calling the God of small things. And the board of small things, so to all these mindsets, skill sets, and they were basically executing industry um, 4.0. And so um, they had a lot of, uh, you know, sort of, they had technology stacks, they had a lot of customer centricity, um, you know, sort of programs, they had a lot of other mechanisms in the manufacturing, which were going to manifest value in a very interesting manner and in, in the way in which they had not basically got uh, the customer, the manufacturing and technology to speak to each other in such a meaningful way. And we had created a set of 
mindset, skill sets that came up organically in the context of the new ecosystem that they'd actually created. And yet they came back saying, would you be able to, uh, because we picked up many uh, behavioral challenges that the organization was struggling with. You know, we'd looked at what was working and we'd also looked at what was not working. And we'd been very appreciative in that orientation because we do our great proponents of uh, positive psychology and, um, you know, um, the, the whole orientation around appreciative inquiry. Yes. But uh, so we, we kind of had, uh, you know, fair amount of data on things that people struggled with in their culture. And so we included something called the God of small things. And the God of small things was simply things like, um, you know, how responsive are you to each other and to the customer? Because if you're not even responsive to each other, we're wondering about the customer, right? Which is small challenges on, um, you know, returning calls, for example. They appear like really small things, but they're not. They have huge ramifications. We don't answer a call when it's the customer at the other end. And here we wanted to be able to build in the respect for the internal customer, which is why would you not return a call in the same day? Or why would you not respond to messages the same day? Uh, you know, even if you don't have the time to be able to respond to all the emails you have, can you have something brief that goes off to all of them saying, I'll come back to you, give me a day or two. Hmm. But just not being responsive is not acceptable. Also, little things like, for example, not accepting a meeting request. If someone gave, gave you a meeting request, um, you know, not letting people know in case you're not going to be meeting timelines that you have committed to. So this very organic style of, you know, you get what you get and we'll do what best we can do kind of culture. And that no organization that is that behaves in this manner with each other, and, you know, is, is going to be capable of being able to uphold high standards or world-class standards of customer centricity. Yeah. And I think we opened up that dialogue and it has very dramatically changed things for that organization because they've gone from having a 5% market share to an 11% market share in a growing market. And I think so much value is just, and I'm talking about value in the value creation sense, is embedded in our everyday behaviors with each other. And what we give ourselves the permission to do or not do in our transactions with each other. And I think that just addressing that and taking that really seriously can go a very, very long way in the context of being able to build a high performing uh, culture. And so high performance culture is our forte and we do this with a lot of organization. It requires the appetite to be able to deal with discordant information. And a lot of that discordant information is around what we're tolerating, what kind of bad behavior are we tolerating here? What can leaders get away with? What do uh, people managers do, which is not the most conducive thing to do for high performance? You know, what are we doing, whether intentionally or not, which is resulting in people underperforming? And I think it requires you to be able to ask and reflect and admit to a lot of this. And I must submit here that the organizations that are willing to deal with that discordant information are truly the learning organizations and they're the ones who benefit the most in the market. I actually was just going to ask you that how open and receptive are they, you know, to, to such feedback and, and criticism, criticism and vulnerability to talk about your flaws and where you can improve. Yeah. Um, and another question that I had while, while you were speaking that came to my mind was that in a large organization, let's say the leaders at the top rung uh, have a cultural idea for the organization. But then, mm -hmm. but then how do you control or manage each person on each management level to adhere to that? You know, like that, mm -hmm. that's so tough to, to bring that synergy because I'm pretty sure leaders aren't directly sort of having a uh, showing, showing by example to, you know, all the members of the organization. So that has to be something that's on the shoulders of so many different people who are at management positions. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So how, how, how was that done? <laughs> yeah, so you're asking how do you kind of cascade this and influence so yeah. many people across the organization. So I must tell you here that to begin with, um, I think it requires some wisdom to know that culture is important for value creation. That your differentiator in the 21st century is not your strategy. Hmm. Is no longer your strategy, right? Your strategy can be uh, imitated, it can be copied, uh, competition gets to know it, there's a flow of talent from organization to organization. If they invited two senior people from your organization for an interview, they would know everything you're doing in the next couple of months. So it's not difficult, it's, it's very permeable now and you can access people's strategies and it's not even that differentiated. Uh, what is truly differentiated, however, is 
how, what is the secret sauce in which you bring performance together. And I think it takes a lot of wisdom and increasingly I find organizations waking up to that, that our real uh, edge or our differentiator is going to come from how we work together as, as, as people within the organization to deliver performance. So to your point on how do you really cascade this, to begin with, a lot of organizations don't have a cognition on what really are these dimensions of culture, or even to understand that your culture is your differentiator. And I think once you get that, mm -hmm. you can actually work on being able to uh, define it, to influence people to understand what it is. I think the fact that you create a linkage between how you behave uh, manifesting into performance uh, is a very important connection. That it's not something that we behave is not in a different space to where we perform. Where we perform and how we behave is highly interlinked to each other. Yes. And that we win in the marketplace because we all behave in a manner with each other. So, for example, I take the, the challenge that you have around collaboration. Yeah, I mean, if, you were, if I were to pick one challenge, which we're seeing every organization talk about, uh, and they have no qualms to your point on showing vulnerability, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, feeling bad about it or not liking that discordant information. This is one piece of discordant information everyone's aware of, and it doesn't take much to be able to get them to be able to submit to it. It almost seems like a national challenge. And it's important to be able to reflect on what's causing this. So oftentimes in the organization, the rhythm in which the organizations even sets goals, they're allowed to set goals as individual departments or functions. They're allowed to execute as individual departments and functions. Their rewards are as for individual divorce, you know, departments and functions. Mm -hmm. And yet the organization is crying out loud for collaboration. So collaboration is something that needs to be managed. It needs to be managed where it matters for people to understand that there's no performance here within the organization that happens on its own in a department or function. But there are high interdependencies and that we'll call out those interdependencies early in the game. Not de facto when the year's over and you say, oh, I wish the teams had collaborated better. Mm -hmm. Also, collaboration uh, cannot be, the behavior of collaboration cannot be left to individuals and their choices. Collaboration is something that you must ensure manifests in the way in which the business is delivered. It is a must have for the business. It's not a nice to have or your choice whether you'd like to you know, bring yeah. forth collaboration or not. So mm -hmm. I think it's not that, it's not, uh, it's not manifested and it's not brought together uh, with the seriousness that, with which it should. Now, what is collaboration? It's a behavior. <laughs> and, um, you know, it, the idea is to also be able to uh, explore why that behavior is not being manifested. What are the insecurities? What, where, what is causing the lack of psychological safety? Uh, many people down the line in teams often submit saying that there are all kinds of practices within the organization that are detrimental to any healthy culture. So, for example, they're not allowed to speak to people in other teams. Or that if they're caught speaking to people in other teams, then their managers are very upset with them because they don't know what information got transpired. This is all within the same organization. And so fundamentally to understand that the competition's outside and it's not inside. <laughs> and to be able to figure out what is causing people to behave in this dysfunctional manner rather than blaming them to be able to understand what have we done in our rhythm of execution that's got people to believe that they got to stay in their own teams, fortify themselves inside their own functions and departments and create these really big walls where no one would know what's really happening in here. There couldn't be anything that's happening in there, which is so detrimental to your to uh, to performance, which is actually will, will actually be detrimental. Let me repeat that. There could be nothing happening there um, that doesn't need to be known to people across functions so that you're able to share that information in the interest of performance. And so, uh, but what gets them to be able to remain guarded uh, in their own silos? And so the silo working uh, is a challenge across. And, um, you know, you have to systemically uh, deal with that. And what I mean by that is that in OKRs, for example, you set goals in a manner where you already involved everyone from the start in the conversation and so when you know that your goal achievement your performance and your rewards are all interlinked so all our faiths are interlinked which indeed they are but they need to also manifest in that manner in the rhythm the cadence of how the organization performs and delivers um, i think slowly you can start eroding this and start building some trust across uh, whatever are these self-created uh, boundaries or barriers so i think this is work to be done 
uh, inside organizations. It's detrimental to healthy organizations. And to the point on culture, collaboration is right at the center of it. Customer centricity is right at the center of all of this. Uh, you know, mutual uh, respect for each other's talent um, and for each other's time uh, is extremely important. Uh, you know, solving problems together is just ever so important, which is how do we come together to solve problems? And that we are responsible collectively for the company's performance. There's no individual or team performance here without the company performance. Hmm. And to articulate that very clearly in the both the recognition and the reward system inside the organization. What organizations end up doing is that um, they maintain a cadence where the company's performance is given some percentage weightage, your performance is given some percentage weight, weightage and it's divided and there's so much confusion and most people believe, but I did my job, the company didn't do their job and all kinds of strange disconnections. Um, so you have a situation where, uh, you know, the patient uh, is, is still unwell or dead and the operation was successful. So everyone believes I did a great job, but you don't have a healthy mm -hmm. patient, you know, or you don't have a patient who's even alive sometimes if the organization's done really badly. And so we need to be able to not create this disconnect, uh, you know, between, between uh, organizational performance and individual performance, especially when you're talking about collaboration. Yeah. No, absolutely.